What is up, everyone? So we've got a few people here. Um, we are going to be covering some pretty cool stuff today. We're going to go over a bunch of uh, cloth physics type stuff in Unreal Engine, just so you guys can kind of jump in if you want to do some of the stuff with me as we go through live on this, or if you want to just watch it afterwards, that works too. We're going to cover some cloth physics stuff. We're going to be showing how to get the cloth to interact with different objects. We are probably not going to cover cloth on characters during this. Um, that is kind of a bit of a different process but uh, we're gonna go through how to set up some stuff, do some very simple things, maybe set up some flags with wind and other little objects like that that'll be moving. Um, we can use it for animation. We can move stuff around and have the cloth interact. It's cool stuff like that. You said volume is too low. Let me double check audio level here. Can bring that up a little bit. What is going on? Um, let me know if the audio is any better and we can get started here. Um, so let's hop on over into our project. Um, I have a few real basic stuff here, but we're gonna kind of start fresh here in just a few minutes, but uh, kind of give you an idea of what we are gonna be working on. Um, so we're gonna simulate here and you can see we got ourselves some pretty cool uh, just cloth that's kind of draping over here and we can um, we can pick some of this stuff up and kind of move it around a little bit. We can take these spheres and move them. You can see the cloth will interact and so forth with each one of these here. So we're going to kind of mess around with a little bit of that and show you how this kind of works. Um, Cloth is not perfect in Unreal by any means. Um, there is a ton of different variables and options and so forth. And uh, we're gonna just kind of touch base on some of the basics of it and see what we can get out of it and show you guys how to set it up and how you can do it all in Unreal, not even have to go outside to Blender or anything else to uh, set up some of the basics of it. Um, so let's get started. Um, if you guys have any questions or anything along the way, just uh, shout it out in the chat there and let me know and we can we can cover some of that stuff. We're primarily going to focus on cloth today, but if you have uh, other questions, I might be able to jump into some of those things as we move along. So let's go ahead and let's do a new level. And I'm just going to kind of share some of my general techniques and things and way I set stuff up. Um, I did create the project here, a uh, new fresh project. I used the third person uh, game template just because I like to have the character in there as uh, scale purposes. Um, and also I can use the character to play the map and level if I wanted to. So um, when I create a new level, so file new level, I almost always choose the basic one. I know a lot of people choose the open world, but the open world is actually kind of based on some other systems um, like sub levels and world partition and stuff. So if you don't need all that stuff, I wouldn't mess with that. Um, you can always do an empty level also. Uh, I typically use the basic level just because I want some pre-made lighting already in the scene uh, without having to create everything else from scratch, which isn't a big deal, but I just typically use the basic level. Um, what's going on, Elliot? Uh, nice to meet you, man. Yeah, glad you could jump in on the live stream here. Okay, so we have a few different things here in our basic level. You get this floor here, which I will say this particular floor object is not the best object. Um, it does interact with certain things the way that it should sometimes. So we're just gonna leave it for now, but because I think it's gonna work okay for us, but um, sometimes it's a great idea to just replace this with a simple plane by going up to shapes and choosing a plane. Um, we're gonna move our character spawn just kind of out of the way over here. And we're gonna set up the basics, super simple, just a simple cloth piece and kind of show you how we can work it in Unreal. So there are a few different plugins that we are going to want to have uh, enabled during this process. OK, so let's go up to our settings and plugins. Um, and if you want to be able to do this exclusively Unreal, uh, there's a few plugins that I'm going to recommend. Um, and the first one is called Skeletal Mesh. 
uh, editing tools. So make sure you have skeletal mesh editing tools uh, enabled. This is gonna allow us to create a skeletal mesh right inside Unreal and not have to exit and go anywhere else. Um, if you don't have it enabled, let's search modeling tools. You're gonna also want the modeling tools editor mode enabled also. This one is an amazing tool. You should always have this enabled because there's tons of stuff that you can do in it right inside of Unreal and not have to go anywhere else to do it. So make sure you have those and we might enable a couple other um, tools, uh, plugins here in a little while. Um, as we get a little bit further, we might cash out some of the simulations. So we'll check out that too. All right, back to our simple basic layout here or level. Uh, what I'm gonna do is we are going to, I got a few things already in here, but I'm gonna kind of start fresh and start from the beginning with you guys, just so you can uh, try this out. So first thing I wanna do is I wanna create a simple cloth, uh, you know, a sheet or whatever that we're going to simulate and just have it kind of interact with a few things. So first thing I'm gonna do is hop over into the modeling tools here and we are going to create a simple rectangle. And you'll see it's kind of clipping through here just a little bit, but don't worry about that. Um, typically what I'll do is I'll uncheck align to normal because I just want it to stay flat. I don't want it to try to align to anything else that's in the scene. And let's go ahead, let's pick say a 200 by 200 uh, on the width and depth of the rectangle. And we need to subdivide this. So I'm gonna enter 100 by 100. Um, that's gonna give us a decent amount of subdivisions here for the cloth. If you don't have enough subdivisions, this isn't gonna work out very well. And this is typically where a lot of people will jump into Blender so they can create this initial plane and subdivide it. But you can do this right inside Unreal using the modeling tools here. So we should have a 200 by 200 with 100 by 100 subdivisions. That's gonna give us a decent amount for actual cloth simulation. So I'm just gonna click in the scene here and then press accept. And you're gonna see it's, uh, it's, it's just basically Z fighting the floor here. So I'm gonna center it out and I'm gonna lift it up to about 100. Let's go, go 200 uh, on the Z axis here. Um, yes, so we will do a little bit of cloth on skeletal mesh. We might touch a little bit of that on this um, particular video. Um, I want to say is Garadriel, Garadriel, something like that. Sorry if I butcher your name. Um, so what we're going to do is um, I'm going to show you a couple different things that you can use inside of a skeletal mesh and stuff like that. But as far as like, a, say, a third person character and a cape or something like that, um, I'm not too familiar with that. There are definitely some tutorials out there on how to do it. It gets a little complex because you got to make sure your collisions on your physics access as physics assets are set up correctly and stuff on your character, things like that. And um, it can be it can be frustrating. Maybe we'll touch a little bit on it. We'll see. Since we do have our third person character already set up in here, we could play around with it. So. All right, we have our general plane here, but to be a cloth asset, it has to be a skeletal mesh, not a static mesh like this. So the next thing we're gonna do is jump back into selection mode here. What we need to do is by enabling that skeletal mesh editing tools in the plugin, we can basically take this mesh here. Let's find it in our content browser. So a quick way to find this in your content browser is by pressing Control B. And so that should open up your content browser and take you to the folder where it's at. You can see I have some other ones here because I was doing some practice work ahead of time, but this is our mesh here. So we're just gonna give this a name here. We're gonna call it SM for skeletal mesh and we're gonna, or um, static mesh. And then we're just gonna call this cloth. Okay, and I put a space in there. So if we right click on this, because we have the skeletal mesh tool plugin enabled, right here at the top, it's gonna to say convert to skeletal mesh. You're gonna get this little tiny uh, dialog box here. Basically, I just leave it as is. I wanna create a new one and click on convert. This will take just a couple seconds here. And what that's gonna do, is gonna take a static mesh and convert it into a skeletal mesh for us. Um, cloth and uh, cloth painting and all that stuff only works on skeletal meshes, not on static meshes. 
All right, so it opens up our content browser here and you can see now we have a our original static mesh and we have a skeletal mesh along with a skeleton um, and it is named accordingly. So now let's go ahead and delete our skeletal mesh in our scene. Let's drag and drop our skeletal mesh of our cloth in. Let's zero it out and set that to 200. Set it to three just so we have a little bit more height in here. So next step is to actually tell it, I want this to be cloth, okay? So what we're gonna do is go to our content drawer, double click on the asset so that we can open up the actual skeletal mesh itself. And uh, by default with the skeletal mesh editing tools on, you're gonna see the editing tools activated. We wanna go ahead and just turn that off for now because we are not actually use, using the editing tools uh, besides converting it in the beginning here. And so here we have our skeletal mesh, our simple plane. And you can see if we go to wireframe, you can see it is, you know, subdivided 100 by 100, which is going to work pretty well for us. Um, if you needed something more game oriented, you could probably decrease that down. Um, there is also, uh, it will dynamically subdivide in the cloth settings. We'll take a look at that too here in just a bit. So our next step is to basically take this mesh here and we're gonna do a couple things first and then we're gonna get into actually painting. First thing we need to do, right click on the actual object and you're gonna see create clothing data from selection. Um, you can give this a name here if you choose um, and you can decide if there's an actual physics as asset which we're not gonna be using. So let's just click, click on create and that's going to create uh, uh, basically the clothing data. Well, it hasn't done anything yet. So what we need to do is we need to actually click on it again right click and we need to apply clothing data. So we're gonna select the one that we just made. So this way you can always go in and you, cre you can create different clothing data using the same skeletal mesh and stuff. So you can experiment with things and always go back to something else that you already made. So that one there took just a few seconds and it has applied the clothing data. At this point, nothing's going to happen. So if we were to save this and jump back over into our level, and if you don't know, Alt S is simulate, or if you come up here to the top, you can click the three buttons and go to simulate, because all we want to do is just simulate. We're not trying to play the game. So Alt S, you'll see nothing happens, okay? It's because we haven't actually told it what area of the mesh is cloth and what is not cloth. So let's hop on over into our skeletal mesh again here. And with our mesh selected, you're going to see here at the top, it says activate cloth paint. Okay, so what that's going to do is that's going to activate the actual cloth painting area and on our on the right side here. So if you don't see this window, you need to go to window and clothing. Make sure that is enabled. I have it docked over here, but this could show up anywhere on your screen, depending on where you have it could be on the left side, right side could be down below, but you're looking for the clothing window. What we're going to do is under clothing data, we're going to select the clothing data item that we created earlier. And you'll see here that basically it turns everything pink, okay? So in general, the color pink and the color black means no clothing data or cloth data is applied to that. If it is white, that means cloth data is applied to that area. So very, very simple. What we're going to do is we're going to scroll down just a little bit here under this same window and you're going to see a couple different options here. So our tool is a brush. You can do a gradient, smooth and fill. There's several different options there. Uh, I'm just going to choose the brush here just so we can actually create our own strokes and where we want things to happen. So um, next down here, there's paint value. So your paint value basically means from zero to 100 how much do I want this to be cloth, okay? So you can use lesser values to create a slightly stiffer like transition. It's basically not on and off. You can create kind of a gradient effect there. So 100 means it is fully completely cloth and is flexible and zero means it is not cloth, okay? And you get radius settings here. So you'll see this is our brush here. It's pretty big. So we're gonna lower this down, let's say 20 or so. And you also have a strength and a fall off, so you can adjust those to your liking. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the paint value to 100, which it already is, and I'm gonna start to paint. And you're gonna see as I paint, this is gonna start turning like a white color. 
So if you come up here and you kind of look down, it's a little easier to see because basically it shows you the full wireframe as you are doing it. And so as I paint this, you'll see I can go over, start painting it all white. And as you start to paint, you'll want to get a little bit slower. It'll start making nicer, finer adjustments. So based on this here, let's actually do this. Let's just cover the whole thing in white. So at this moment, if I cover everything in white, this entire thing is going to turn into one giant cloth and basically it's going to fall, okay? So let's click on deactivate paint, uh, cloth paint. And what that's gonna do is, you probably can't see the whole thing, but here on the right side, it's gonna start applying some skinning to the actual mesh. And you're gonna see my mesh disappeared here. So basically what has happened is it's simulating the cloth. And since everything is cloth, it all fell through the ground because <laughs> there's basically nothing really stopping it. There's no collisions in this view. So if I jump over into our actual scene here and I press Alt S, you'll see everything kind of fell. Well, it's not really doing anything at the moment, right? It's just kind of falling. So there's a couple things we need to do here. So first of all, let's make it look like some cloth, shall we? So let's hop into Quixel Bridge. And under Quixel Bridge, you can always come up here and go under surfaces and fabric and find a cool fabric that you like. Um, let's see. Shall we go? Let's go a little wacky with it, shall we? So we're gonna pick this crazy pink polka dotted fabric here. I'm gonna pick high quality. Let's click download real quick. It shouldn't take too long. Volume is still low, right? That's what I'm getting here. So let's see if we can crank this up just a little bit, guys. I am sorry that the volume's a little low, but let's see if we can get our volume up a little bit. Check, check, check. Is that any better there? Should be the mic input should be turned up a little bit more. Uh, just let me know in the chat there. So what we're gonna do is uh, I'm gonna click add here. So now we've got this fuzzy pink polka dotted uh, material here. I'm gonna minimize that. Let's hop into our content drawer under mega scans and surfaces. I'm gonna filter by material instance. I have a few of them in here already. And we're gonna drag and drop this cool, fuzzy polka dotted material on here, okay? Uh, let's make a quick adjustments while we're here. So we'll hop into tiling. I'm gonna set this to two by two. And the other thing we wanna do uh, with cloth is typically we wanna set the material to two-sided um, because as most of you know, on a simple plane, the material only shows up on one side, but there's occasions that you might see the back side of the cloth. So we wanna make sure that we have two-sided turn on. So if you search two-sided within the material instance, you can always turn on two-sided. And let's press save and hop back into our level. So now you can see if we go underneath the plane, we have cloth on both sides, right? All right, so if we simulate again, still nothing quite yet, okay? Real simple way to test this is we're gonna do a couple things here. First thing, let's add in a basic shape here and we're gonna choose a sphere. Let's zero out the position here and let's move this up so that our cloth will kinda fall down and drape over the sphere, okay? So if we press Alt S, nothing happens. Still nothing happens, okay? There's a few different things that we gotta make sure we always check if you want it to interact with objects in your scene, okay? The very first thing we wanna do is make sure we select our actual cloth plane here. And in our details panel on the left side, or on the right side, or wherever it is on your screen, you're gonna jump on down and under um, the clothing, there's a section called clothing, there's two check boxes we need to turn on. One is collide with environment, and the other one is force collision update. So once you have both of those two turned on, checked on, now if we simulate, well, what do you know? We actually get a little bit of interaction with that sphere. So we're getting some weird artifacts going on here. There's a couple different things that are happening here. One is it feels like the cloth is still hitting some sort of 
bottom, like a fake invisible bottom. We're getting a lot of stretching and as I mentioned, cloth, chaos cloth isn't perfect. Uh, so we're getting a little bit of like twitches and movement and stuff when it should just kind of stop, right? So let's fix a few of these problems here. So the next thing we're gonna do is in our actual sphere here, let's say it's still not colliding with whatever object you put in. There's a couple things we need to do with that. So in our sphere, uh, open up our stack mesh. This one comes with collisions already pre-applied because it's the basic shape object, but you can always open up your static mesh and come up to show and show simple collisions. So cloth basically works with simple collisions, not complex collisions. Uh, there may be a way to get it to work with complex collisions, but uh, for the most part, you're probably not going to want to do that because it's a lot of data and a lot of processing. But you can see when I do the simple collisions, you can see there is our simple collision around the sphere there. Okay. Um, so make sure that's turned on your mesh if you're using a custom mesh. You're going to want to do that. The next thing we can do is in the right details panel here with our actual sphere uh, selected, you're going to want to come down to collision. Okay. Um, Right now it's just set to default, but I always like to choose block all because I want to make sure it's going to block all and it still works. You can see there. Okay. Uh, the next thing we want to do is um, let's say when we simulate, I want to be able to grab this sphere and I want to be able to move it right now. I can't move it. I can grab the cloth, however, and move the cloth. Right. But let's say I want to be able to move the sphere and have it interact. Well, it doesn't let us do that currently while simulating. So the next thing we want to do is we need to take this mesh here. We're going to set it to movable. Okay. Instead of static or stationary, we're going to set it to movable. But before we try this again, when you set an object to movable, it automatically changes your collision presets to block all dynamic. Okay. We're going to click the arrow on that. So it goes back to block all. If it's block all dynamic, it's not going to work. And I'll show you that actually let's undo that. So if I simulate now, it's not colliding anymore. Okay. So make sure you reset this to block all and press play. And now you see we're getting collisions. And as I move the sphere around, we're going to get a little bit of tearing here. I'm going to show you how to fix some of that, but you can see the actual sphere will actually start to move and interact with the actual object. And we can move around, create some pretty cool effects and fun stuff. So obviously if you're going to do this, um, if you're going to do this like in sequencer, you can always record animation and it would do that. But if you ever wanted to just have some real time fun and kind of move stuff around, this is a pretty neat way of being able to do that. Right? So we're still getting some really weird stuff going on here. So let's stop that. Uh, what's up, Romaine? Um, how can we record the simulation to play then in movie sequencer? Um, so we're probably going to touch that here in just a little while. Um, what you can always do is if you want to basically bake the simulation, you can use uh, chaos caching. And so we may touch on that here in just a little bit, um, but let's get through some of the basics here. And then I'll show you how you can uh, record some of that so that you could play that back uh, in sequencer. You can, however, always do it um, dynamically in sequencer each time. Um, unfortunately, sometimes you might have some mishaps or things could change. So it's nice to be able to record something say I like it, then slap it in the sequencer. Um, but anytime you use sequencer, it basically simulates anyways. Um, and you could always basically, um, you could do some warm up frames so that things aren't just, you know, you're not seeing your cloth drop from the beginning. You could do some warm up frames so it's already dropped and started moving, stuff like that. But yeah, we'll, we'll go over some of that stuff here in just a little bit. So the next thing we need to do is fix this plane, uh, the actual cloth, because if you notice when we when you simulate, it appears to have this imaginary fake distance. OK, and I'm going to show you basically what is happening with this. So if we jump into our cloth here, um, you can see, let me select right here. So under the cloth data information in the clothing window, there's this mask here and it says max distance. So I've seen some people, they can uncheck this box and it works for them. I don't know if it's a 5.3 thing or what the deal is because we're using uh, 5.3.2 currently, but that does not seem to work for me. 
So what we need to do is we need to increase that max distance. Basically, there's a limit there and it's telling it, I don't want this to simulate outside of this area and stop it, okay? So let's jump back into our level and let's increase that distance. So perhaps maybe for a video game or lower end hardware, you could limit that for some reason if you needed to, but we don't wanna do that for this. We want it to have it uh, fully done and open to just do stuff. So here in your details panel, if you just search max, you're going to see cloth max distance scale. I'm gonna crank that up to 10, okay? Now, if we simulate, now you can see there's no more fake bottom floor anymore. Okay, uh, we're getting some weird funky stuff here. Good old chaos cloth, okay? So, but you can see no more fake bottom and stuff. And basically what's happening is this is, this is ripping through. Um, so let's fix that. So let's jump back into our cloth um, asset here. And under the clothing window, we are going to scroll down just a little bit here. And there's a section called config, okay? And under config, some of this stuff is kind of hard to find and see. I wish they would change the way to get to this or a simpler menu. However, you'll see cloth configs and then there's two different sections here. There's chaos cloth config and then there's chaos cloth shared sim config, okay? The easiest way to start fixing some of that ripping and tearing and stuff is under simulation, there's two different numbers here. There's iteration count and then there's subdivision count, okay? Um, subdivision basically does like a dynamic subdivision on it as it's simulating. So let's say, let's, we're gonna try five on this just for funsies so we can see what happens, okay? I'm gonna save that, jump back in here and simulate. And you'll see that looked way better than the other one was. The other one was basically stretching out a ton and causing weird issues. So that alone, just by increasing our subdivision count, that has fixed a ton of the stretching and stuff like that. We're still getting a little bit of this jiggling effect here. And unfortunately, we, we can try to fix some of that stuff. There are some values that basically say under a certain amount, stop doing this. Um, we might possibly jump into that. But as you can see, this looks a whole lot better. We're actually starting to get pretty decent folds. It's not crazy stretching out and stuff. And if I take our sphere, we can move our sphere and kind of make it fall. So we have no collision on our floor currently. So that's, it's just gonna kind of fall through. But you can see, we can actually start to play around a little bit, move stuff and get some actual real time collisions. Pretty cool. So let's jump back into our cloth. I'm gonna drop this down to two. Of course, the higher you do this, the higher the number, the more resource power it takes. So let's just try two and see if we can still get pretty good results here. So that's getting us too much stretching there. So there's another thing that we can kind of do is we can start to adjust this other value called iteration count. Basically, it's how many iterations it uses to actually calculate. So I'm gonna take that to two and let's see what we get at two. Save that. Okay, so that doesn't look too bad either. We didn't get a bunch of crazy stretching, just a little bit, and it looks quite a bit better. So you can see here, we're still getting a little bit of stretching, but not horrible, and I am moving it pretty quickly, okay? So let's take our iteration count up to, say, five. Just kind of a, a higher number like we had on the actual subdivision count. And let's see how that, okay. Still a little bit of stretching, not too bad though, okay? And of course, like, you're not gonna be moving stuff quite this fast, You typically when you're doing stuff. Um, you do have to be careful. Let's say you wanted to have a piece of cloth and drop something in it. Um, it's probably not gonna work super, super well. It, it's, it's, there's a lot happening and happening in real time. So stretching and breaking and ripping through is kind of part of the game, unfortunately. There's probably lots of ways to fix that, um, but that takes a lot of fine tuning. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hop back in here. So we weren't getting a crazy fix at, at five iteration counts. So I'm gonna take the subdivision back up to five and the iteration at two and save that. And let's see what we get here out of that one. That looked and felt pretty good. You could see though, we're getting a little bit 
not like stutters. Let's let's just do our show FPS. So our FPS drops pretty drastically when we're doing this, right? There's a, there's a lot going on. So let's go ahead and just set this to three on our subdivision count. I think that's going to help us out a little bit. Yeah, that definitely helped out our frames for a second. We're still getting a pretty decent look and effect. Not a ton of stretching. OK, you can see how our sphere kind of pokes through a little bit there. Um, I'm going to show you kind of an easy way to fix that. Um, it's probably not the perfect way to do this, but it's a nice little easy way to be able to fix that. OK, so under our cloth information here, there is under the cloth uh, chaos cloth config section right here. There is a ton of little drop down boxes, lots of them, right? So. This is all the different variables that allow you to adjust how the cloth reacts. You know, is it this super soft, silky, like lightweight material? Is it like burlap or leather that's kind of heavy? Um, this is where all that stuff comes into play. So you have stuff like density and edge stiffness, um, all sorts of different options here, right? You kind of have to go in and play around and just see what everything does. Um, we're not going to really cover everything in this. However, there is a thing that you can get if you hop into your Unreal um, uh, library. If you don't already have it, uh, you can search for what is it? Content examples. It's on the marketplace. Download the latest content examples. And there's actually a whole level dedicated to cloth. And you can go in there and see how they set up a lot of the cloth and you can copy and migrate that stuff over. You can copy over settings, all sorts of stuff. So you can see how it works. Um, there's a lot of cool examples in there. So uh, definitely a good way to jump in and be able to just copy and paste a few things and try it out um, without starting from scratch like this. But it's always good to be able to do it from scratch and kind of learn your methods. So um, what we're going to do is in here, there's a couple different things that we can do. Um, see looking for it here like i said there's so many options but there's basically uh, a collision thickness right here so under collision properties there's collision thickness so right now it's basically at one unreal unit um like one centimeter or whatever it is and so by increasing this say three and saving that now when we go ahead and simulate what has happened is basically it's put like a three unreal unit space between the mesh and the actual, you can see there's a gap there now. And that helps prevent some of the poking through of something. Yes, it's not gonna simulate perfectly around it, wrapped around it, but basically you're giving like a three centimeter little gap around it, which helps a lot with that type of stuff. So now if I grab the sphere and I start to move it around, you can see my ball isn't like the sphere's not poking through as much unless I start to really move it and jerk it around like that. Okay. So pretty, pretty cool. So one thing that we can do is currently what we're doing is we're basically simulating this cloth and the whole thing is dropping because it's all just one giant material and cloth and so forth. Right. What if, say, we wanted it to not just be one giant cloth and fall down, okay? Let's say we wanted it to be like a curtain or something, or maybe even a flag, and we want it to simulate, but have part of it stay there. So what we can do is simply hop into our cloth uh, section here again in our, on our skeletal mesh, and what we're gonna do is activate cloth painting again, okay? So as I mentioned before, everything that's white is basically cloth that's going to get simulated. And anything that you make either black or if it was already pink in the beginning is not going to be cloth. So let's go back to our brush settings again. I'm going to close this config stuff real quick. So under our brush settings here, I got it set to 20. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the paint value to zero, meaning I want this to basically paint on like where I'm going to paint, I do not want it to simulate cloth. OK, so there's a couple different things we could do here. So I'm just going to paint this long line here 
it's kind of hard to paint sometimes or at least get straight lines. It can be quite difficult to do that. But do the best that you can. I wish you could like maybe hold shift and it would just stay in line on one axis or something like that would be pretty cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to deactivate cloth here. It's going to take a second. It's going to, you know, do all the paint weight painting and stuff like that. And you're going to see as it does the little simulation in here. All right. Now we have like basically an area that would be connected. OK, so if we drop back into our level here and we simulate, let's find out where our cloth is. OK, so basically this left side is our cloth. But let's say I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees and simulate. OK, now if I take my sphere, you can see I can actually start to move and dynamically adjust this. Say it was a curtain or something of that sort. That is a pretty cool way to be able to simulate that and do this. As I mentioned before, so I actually have a player character in here. Um, I'm going to play this real quick, but you'll see that we don't really get interaction with this because there's some different stuff that you have to set up for like a third person character and getting that to interact. Even though this has already got collisions and stuff like that on it, um, it's just there's some other things that we have to do to be able to do that. Um, there are some pretty great tutorials out there, too. If you search like character cloth and stuff, um, you might check those out. But anyways, back to our simple simulations here. So this is a pretty cool way to be able to get um, some effects like this and be able to move stuff around. And one thing you could always do is you could always basically create a sequence. And let's just say I'm going to come in here, create a material real quick. We're just going to call this blank, right? And I'm going to make this a masked material. This is a good way if you ever wanted to make a blank material. Um, you can come in here, make it a masked material here under blend mode. And then under the masked material, just set it to a parameter and set it zero or a constant or whatever and save that. So now you basically have a material that has uh, basically nothing on there. It's just a blank material. So now what we can do is I could take that blank material, add it to our sphere, right? And now what we can do is when we simulate, we don't see the sphere anymore, but I could still use the sphere to interact, right? So I could create like, I don't know, maybe a ghostly effect or something like that, where something is like slowly pushing through the cloth or something, but you don't see what's actually doing it, you know? Pretty cool little effect. It'd be a neat way to, I don't know, make something, but it's a neat way to be able to create interaction with with the the cloth and not actually see the object that's uh, affecting it uh pretty pretty cool little method i think it's very neat um so something you could do like that i'm going to set it back to our normal material just so we can we can see it properly when we're doing stuff okay so what is something else that we could do with this so another really good go to is a flag, right? So at the moment, if we simulate, you can see basically nothing happens here, right? It, it is simulating, but nothing happens because nothing's interacting with it until we, you know, move something into the scene. So this is a pretty good actually example of how I said I added like that three centimeter collision. You can see I'm not actually quite touching it yet, but that helps to prevent some of that breaking through. Um, the, the cloth material and seeing the underneath object. So, all right, so let's make this into a flag, shall we? So just for funsies, let's take a shape. We're gonna do a cylinder and we're just gonna stretch this baby out, make it a little bit smaller flagpole like that. Okay. And we know that we were basically simulating from at the moment, this is at the top. So we're going to rotate that, right? Just a little bit like that and come over here. Let's just line this puppy up. Something like that. Let's move our sphere out of the way. So now we could do something like that, right? So if we simulate, now it kind of looks a bit like a flag, a very limp, like lame, cheap flag, because there's no wind. There's nothing happening here. 
So typically a flag isn't completely held on on the entire side. So if we hop back in here to our actual material, we activate our cloth paint again. I'm going to set my value to 100 and let's set our radius to like 50. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint. Let's set our radius to 40. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint right here and right here. We'll keep a little dot in the middle. So a flag is probably held on typically by like three little grommets or whatever where it's connected like that. So something something kind of like that. Let's press save. Oops. Can't just press save. You got to make sure you deactivate the cloth paint because that does all the, the weight painting and stuff for you. So once you've done that and you click on save. Cool. Now we're getting a better effect here. It's going to be a little weird because it's, you know, it's material and it's kind of getting um, a little bit stretched out, but you can see it's still simulating in those areas. So now if we come in here and we simulate, now you can see we have three little points basically that it's simulating on. I'm going to push that in just a little bit. There we go. All right. So super, super simple. Make sure you save your map here. We're going to call this test two. Make sure you uh, control shift S is save all, or you can come down here uh, and this will show how many items are unsaved. You can always click on that and it'll let you save them. So let's add a simple wind. So if you come up under here under the plus button to add objects and you come into all classes here, if you just highlight this and type in wind, you're going to see a wind directional source. So just click on that and it's going to add it in here. So under the wind directional source, you'll see this has a larger blue like arrow. So that is the direction of the wind. So you can, it doesn't matter where you put this, it's basically globally across your map. Um, you can always change that to a point wind. So under the details panel, call it a point wind and give it a radius so that it only affects things within that radius. But for now, we're just going to do a global wind. I'm going to point it something like that. See how that goes. And let's try simulate, see what happens. Nothing's happening, right? Thought we added our wind. Well, we did, but we didn't give it enough. So we need to give it some strength here. So I'm going to just pop the strength and speed up to, say, three and see what happens. OK, so we're starting to get a little bit here, a little bit of movement. Let's rotate this guy back, I guess, a little bit. See what happens there. A little bit of wind. Let's take this baby up to, say, five and five. OK. So we're starting to get a little bit of wind here, maybe 10 on our strength. Still not quite. 10 on our speed. There we go. I think that's a little much on our speed, maybe seven. And of course, it depends on what kind of look you're going for with your flag. But now you can see we have a completely interactive flowing type of flag. So this is something that could easily be done for real time, you know, type simulations, games, so forth, or this can also be in your sequencer. So um, this is super easy. When you go to actually do it in your sequencer, it'll just simulate like normal. You probably want to add some warm up frames so that the flag has a moment to drop down and start moving with the wind. Otherwise, you would see that at frame one, you'd see it all stiff and then it would drop and start flowing. So uh, always add some warm up frames if you're going to be simulating stuff like that. Uh, let's set that up to let's do eight in eight. Just see what we get here. Cool. And like I said, as you adjust the actual materials inside and the statistics inside the actual cloth here, so when we come in here and we open up our config section again under density, you can start messing around with with some of that stuff, like these numbers here. Um, let's try a density of nine. Let's just see what that does for us here. But like I said, the density, see, it's a much, much heavier. So even though we have that wind there, it's not even changing it because that density is so high on that cloth now. Really, really heavy stuff. So let's set it to let's say like a 0.2 and let's make it a little bit lighter than default and see what happens. There we go. 
And one thing you can do is while you're simulating, if you select your wind here, you can actually start to change the values here. This will help you kind of dial in what you're looking for. But one thing to remember is when you stop simulating, it's gonna reset those numbers. So make sure you keep track of what those numbers are as you're doing it while simulating it. And then once you stop, go back and change it to, to those settings. So like right now, if I set it to two on speed, it's not, it's not enough, you know what I mean? Four, five, six. So you can see where you might wanna get it. 10, you want a crazy, you know, crazy wind going on. And then the strength, you could take that down to one, two point one. see what happens. So the way these, these values work is kind of interesting. So you just kind of have to dial them in, try them out, see what works for you. Um, and then there's even like minimum and maximum gusts and stuff like that. So you can adjust those to, to see how that affects what the look is that you're going for. So using the wind and the density values, you can adjust how that's gonna come out. So um, what you can do now, like I said, so as you notice here, it's 510.110 on our values here. So if I stop simulating, it resets it. So I just need to go back in 510.1 and 10. I like that look, right? So there we go, cool uh, flag effect. It's pretty fast, pretty crazy. But what's neat is while this is all still happening, you can still interact with it with the real time stuff, the collisions happening here, okay? So one thing that you may have noticed or may not have noticed is the cloth itself does not have self collisions. Um, self collisions is very processor intensive. Um, and I've never really been able to get it to work very well. Most of the time it just kind of glitches out. Um, if anybody knows any good resources out there, please let me know, put them in the comments or anything in the chat. Um, if there's a, a good proper way of getting self collisions. So you'll notice how a lot of times it'll flap through itself, like there's no self collisions. So kind of a bummer, um, but for a lot of very simple things, I think it works pretty well. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is, um, so now we have our, our flag set up here and you can do that type of stuff. Um, let's say we wanted to take the cloth and simulate it and be able to use it later. Okay, so we wanna use it in sequencer and not have to worry about um, simulating it every time, right? We wanna be able to basically cache it or bake it out, okay? So what we can do is, um, there's a couple things that we need to do here. First things first, we're gonna go to our uh, plugins and we're gonna search for cache, okay? And I have it enabled already, but it's called chaos caching. So you need to enable chaos caching to be able to do this. Um, chaos is like a whole system. So you have chaos physics with like destruction and stuff. There's chaos cloth. Um, there's several things that kind of fall under the chaos category. So chaos caching allows you to be able to cache all that type of stuff. So let's hop back into our level now that we have that enabled. And what we can do is in here, we're gonna select our actual cloth in the scene. And when we do that, let me remember here, there's a couple different things that we have to do. Oh, okay, so we have our actor selected. We come up to actor and chaos. We create a chaos manager, okay? So I'm gonna make a new folder here called Chaos Man Managers. Okay, let's go in here. Let's give this flag. We'll just call it CM for Chaos Manager and call it flag. Okay, and we're gonna click Save. So what that's going to do is when it creates that Chaos Manager, you're gonna see it pop up in your outliner here. So you'll actually notice it. it is down here. It's one, It's like still got one of the old, uh, old icons, right? So under the Chaos Manager here in your Details panel, you're going to see a lot of different options here. We're going to only go over some of the basic stuff here, right? 
So currently you can see that um, it's experimental and so forth, but for the most part, it works all right. So under the chaos manager, you'll see it has the, the cache collection, which is our flag. It's created that for us. Um, and then it has cache mode record. Then there's play and static pose. Uh, there's timed mode, start time, all that kind of stuff there, right? So what we want to do is we actually want to uh, basically record this. So we're going to set that to record. And as long as this is selected here, when we actually go to uh, simulate, it is going to record that cache, okay? So let's simulate. Let's let our flag play for just a little bit here. And then we're gonna press stop, okay? And so now it is recorded there, okay? But what one thing we need to do is we need to make sure we change this to play because otherwise next time we uh, re we simulate again, it's going to try to record again. But now that it's set to play, it's not going to overwrite that. Okay. So super simple. Let's go ahead and create a level sequence here. Um, we're just going to call this flag underscore sequence. Okay. Let me dock this down below. Typically have this on another window, but for streams, we have to dock it here. What's going on, guys? What's going on? Design and Astria and Slash Elfenstein. Glad you guys could jump in and join us here. If you guys have questions and stuff or follow through, just let me know. Um, so now what we can do is we can take the Chaos Manager and we can drag and drop that into our actual sequence here. And so under, under the Chaos Manager, we're going to add a new track and it is the start time. And what we basically what has happened is there is a time here. So if I come over here and since this is selected at play, if I choose our start time here, give me just a second here. Don't crash on me. Okay, there we go. Um, so you can see here as I scrub through the start time, it's actually playing back the flag animation that we just recorded, okay? So I'm just gonna set that back to zero because I don't want that there. So basically what you do is using the start time, which isn't just the start time, it is like basically the entire uh, time frame of what you're doing. So let's say I want to start this at, at one second, okay? Oh, you can see our flag actually changed because at one second, this is where our flag was. So let's do that again. Let's just get a little bit further into it. So we're gonna set it to four, okay? At four seconds right here, that's where it's gonna start for us, basically the playback, okay? So if we're at 30 frames per second and we have 150 frames right there, that's five seconds. So I'm gonna add another keyframe here and four plus five is nine because we're going to move forward five seconds, right? Because if you change those times, if the times don't match up with your timeline, uh, it'll either move faster or move slower, which you might want. You could actually speed ramp that and do stuff like that. Um, I don't know exactly how well it caches like in between frames. So if you're trying to slow something down, that may not work very well. Uh, the next thing we need to do is you'll notice that these are set to auto Bezier like curve. We need to just set those to linear. So select both dots, um, right click on a dot and go to linear there. That way they're linear. Otherwise, it's going to try to create a curve of your animation, which we don't want to do. So now if I come in here and... Uh, real quick note, if you go into this little play and cog here, you can select keep playhead in the playback range while scrubbing. So while you're scrubbing through, it won't let you actually go outside of it. You can always click outside, but it doesn't let you go outside. Um, and so now you can see that is our flag and recorded in sequence. So we actually didn't record that many seconds worth. Uh, <laughs> we, we didn't record nine seconds worth. It looks like we only got uh, up to, where does it stop? So almost seven seconds, 6.9 seconds or so. But this is a way that you can basically bake the animation. Um, I know, Romaine, you were talking about this earlier, asking about it. So this is a way to cash out the simulation and be able to scrub through it later and just slap it into your actual sequencer. 
And what's great is you can move this chaos manager into basically any sequence. And now I can take this flag and I can move it wherever I want. So I can move it way over here. And you'll see it's still gonna play. We are getting a few weird artifacts here. Yeah. Maybe we can't do that. Maybe because it has to do with the breaking points or the points of where it's connected. I'm not sure. Well, that is good to know. I did not know that. So it looks like you still have to keep it where it is for the most part. I wonder. I don't think it has anything to do with the actual chaos manager thing. I don't think you can move that. Oh, maybe. No, no, I'm still doing that for whatever reason. So I'm not too sure about that. Maybe you have to bake it in that position. So it's probably best idea to just keep it in that position and bake it there before you move it around, okay? But that's still uh, a pretty cool way of being able to do that. And that way, say if you're gonna be doing a short film or something and you want it to be the same every time, it's gonna be the same every time because every time you like render out uh, something and if you're just relying on the simulation, might be different every time. Sometimes it might get stuck. And that would really suck if you are rendering out, uh, say, a path trace scene or something super long. Uh, and you you spent hours rendering it and then you realized, oh, my cloth kind of fell and ended up getting stuck for whatever reason. So this is a great way to make sure that you can still have that same animation over and over and over each time, right? So for fun, let's try this. So we went from four to nine seconds. I'm just going to change that to five. Let's see what happens. So, I mean, it looks fairly smooth. There's probably a, at a certain rate that you probably wouldn't want to do that. It's it's a little poppy. So when it records the actual simulation, it's probably recording at like a certain frame rate or something of that sort. Um, it may just be whatever your screen refresh rate is. Who knows? But um, but that's kind of cool. That way you could maybe even create an effect of like a gust of wind. So like you could speed ramp it real quick, you know, and bring it back down. That'd be kind of a cool effect. Yeah. So there you go. Like that is a pretty cool way of being able to simulate that and keep it there. So what's neat, um, instead of just being able to like put this in here and let's say you wanted to render out a scene that's not actually moving. You just want to do a still render. You know, what's great about this is I can take these two times here and I can just set them to the same, uh, same number. So now I just have this still frame that's just got that flag in that motion, right? So I'm going to render out a still frame, but I still want that physics look on this flag, but I don't want it to try to animate or anything like that. And since it's cached, Boom, it's done. It's in the frame that I want. I could pick whatever frame, you know, position. Like, oh, I don't like the way the flag looks right there. So I like it. Oh, right here with the little flap coming up the top. Now you could actually do that, dial it in, and just keep that same keyframe so that it doesn't actually change over frame by frame. Uh, another cool thing that you can do with this, right, is let's go ahead um, with caching in mind. Okay. So what we're going to do is let's put our sphere back where we are. Um, what's going on? Uh, who see who say, um, nice to see you joining in with this here. Um, so character cloth, uh, Barood, um, character cloth stuff is a little bit different. Um, let me show you one more thing here with the, the, caching of the chaos cloth and we'll jump into a character real quick just to just to have some quick little fun. So I'm going to I'm going to leave the wind there real quick. I'm going to show you what else we can do. So I'm going to jump back into our cloth here and I'm going to go ahead and activate the paint. We're going to get rid of those those points there. So we're going to scroll down to our paintbrush and our paint value is at 100. Cool. So I'm just going to paint those all over deactivate the cloth again, or deact deactivate cloth paint, not the actual cloth, we still want it. And you can see now we're just like completely falling through and stuff, right? So, um, oh, are we still? I'm not sure why we're simulating. 
Oh, it's because we have our chaos cache. So I'm going to delete that cache from the timeline here. And then what I'm going to do is take the chaos cache manager here and I'm going to reset that back to record. OK, so we should. OK, cool. So right now things are looking a little actually, let's go ahead and delete the chaos cache. We can always make another one. OK, this way we're not getting interference or anything like that. So we got some wind going on still. Uh, but what I want to do is I'm going to take this cloth and I'm going to rotate it back out to like a flat plane. Let's reset that, set it to 300. I'm not entirely sure why it is simulating already without actually doing anything. However, um, it is what it is. So there we go. So now we're basically back to our original cloth type setup here, right? Um, and what we can do is I'm going to rebring this cloth back in and close this sequencer here. We might actually have to duplicate it. Uh, let's see. There's our skeletal mesh. Set that back. Um, what's cool too is like this doesn't necessarily have to be cloth. It just could be anything that's kind of flexible like that. So something I've kind of messed around with in the past is um, like a skin. So I don't know exactly what you would use this for, but you could. I'm going to set the tiling up here. Uh, we're going to set our roughness to 0.4, make it look kind of kind of gross. And uh, put that back in there. So now we have this skin looking material. You can see it's glossy. Um, Let's go back to that material. Make sure we search two so we can set it to two sided. Said a lot of times you're going to want to set that to two sided on cloth because there's going to be times when you see the back side of it. And so now if we simulate, we're not getting it because we need to set up our initial parameters again. So here in the details panel, we're going to scroll down to because we deleted it and, and added it back in. We need to collide with environment and force collision. Okay. So now you can see we get this weird thing and we also need to cut off our max distance. So search max in the details panel, take that up to 10 and then I'll drop it. So now we kind of get this weird, gross looking skin looking thing. OK, <laughs> so um, one more thing we're going to do is we're going to jump into actual cloth material here and I'm going to change the density a little bit higher. So. Let's go like 0.7. Want it to feel a little bit heavier. Press save, simulate. There we go. Kind of like this leathery skin looking cloth stuff, right? So we could still move it around like we were before. We can mess around with it, whatever. Okay. What's cool though is when we simulate, you can have multiple things work together. So you could take the wind, and I have the wind selected here. Okay. And I can start playing around with some of the values here. And so you can see I start to get wind even though it's on top of the sphere, right? So you could create something like this where I want it to be on top of something but still have wind interaction and stuff. And like I said, you can see there's no self collisions, but for a game and most simple cinematic stuff, like it's gonna work pretty good. Now, if you get real serious in the cloth simulations, uh, you're probably not going to want to do it in Unreal anyways to begin with, but getting a lot of the basics uh, works pretty well. Um, and let's see if we take our win. What do we what do we need to get to to get it off of this thing here? Yeah, it looks like it's starting to stretch a little bit. But you can see how something like this would be kind of cool. Like, I don't know, somebody driving on a motorcycle and something hits them in the face and it's like flapping behind them or something like that. But you could see like how you could do something like this. Oop, looks like we might get it. It looks like it's going to come off here in just a second. And it's got, there's values that you can adjust the slickness and the friction and stuff like that. And whoop, there we go. <laughs> cool. So just something kind of neat that you can play with some ideas. It's all about these ideas. When you try something new like this and you have an idea of like, OK, man, that is such a cool effect. How could I use that? You know, I could, you know, have a motorcycle driver and all of a sudden something smacks him in the on his helmet and it's 
blind in them or something. I don't know, something like that. You just think of ideas that you can use these type of effects, okay? Um, so the la uh, one quick thing we're going to do, one more uh, chaos cache, right? So I have this selected again, and I'm going to come back up here to the top again under Actor, and then Chaos, Create Chaos Cache Manager. We already have one there, but we're going to call this one different because we want to do a separate one, and we're going to just call this, I don't know, Sheet. <laughs> okay. So that is now in our thing, and if we select the Chaos Manager here, it's on Record. It's got our uh, correct one selected and stuff, right? So what we're going to do is on record, let's go back to our sequence. We can open our sequence back up wherever we put it. I don't know where we put it. So instead of looking for, oh, there we are. So now we're going to take this new chaos manager. I'm going to slap that in there. Okay. And we're not going to do anything yet because we want to make sure we simulate. Okay. So at this moment, now what we can do is I'm going to turn off wind because I don't want stuff flapping around and we're just going to simulate. OK, and it's going to fall and drape over this thing. OK. I'm going to do it just like that and then we're going to press stop. OK, so now our chaos, our chaos manager has that in there. So we go to our chaos manager, switch it from record to play. So now it's going to do only playback stuff. We're going to add our start time track to our chaos manager here and let's type in one let's type in three maybe five cool so now and i'm going to add a keyframe there so now you could see basically what we could do is if you want to set dress say some sort of environment but you wanted some cloth laying over an asset and so instead of like, oh, this asset, you know, say it's a barrel or a box or I don't know, something like that, say a crate that had a tarp over it, you could actually do that inside Unreal. So instead of having to go outside to Blender and, and you know, create that and bake it and simulate it in, on, in Blender and bring it back over, you could do that here in Unreal. So now if I wanted to, I could literally just take this piece. I have this piece and it's already set up at that position and it's baked and I could take this and move it anywhere. If I wanted to put on top of a character or whatever, whatever I simulate it on, I could easily do that. Um, and that would be a pretty cool effect uh, to do that. Um, uh, Asteria, Astria. Um, yeah, so there is uh, definitely some new stuff with actual like skeletal mesh tools and weight painting, uh, skinning, um, stuff like that in Unreal 5.3. I've done a little bit. My last stream uh, showed how you could very simply create like a donut and give it some actual like uh, bones and uh, weight paint it so that it actually kind of jiggled and moved a little bit. So that is some pretty cool stuff. Um, a lot of it's still very new. And I'm sure if you have a pipeline of doing things in uh, Blender or Cinema 4D or whatever else you use, you know, if you already have that pipeline and you're good at it, you might as well. But if you're trying to be like me, I don't want to go outside of outside of Unreal for anything else if I don't have to. So as much as I can do inside Unreal, this is the way to do it. Um, so that's just me. But uh, so there you go. Now you have this cool little, uh, basically it's an actual asset and and it's been simulated and, and essentially baked using the Chaos Manager um, uh, type system. And this one, since you're not going to be moving it, you could basically move it anywhere and you could put it on top of whatever you want. Um, it could be cloth or um, anything that you could simulate in this type of effect. Um, I want to show you guys an example of something real quick. So let me grab a browser window here. I'm going to show you one of the videos that I did. Uh, actually, I should have the video video. Um, I'm going to show you one thing that I did inside of uh, Unreal. And so basically I had, um, you can see that there, there we go. Um, so I had this dragon asset uh, that I had gotten off the marketplace, right? Pretty cool dragon asset stuff. Um, it's all rigged and animated and stuff like that. But if you notice here, 
look at his wings, these like skin flaps. So the you can see there's like bones inside the wings and then there's like the skin flaps in between, right? So you can see as he is moving, you can start to see some wrinkles in those wings. And so even as he comes up, there's wrinkles there. And same thing when he comes down, you can see there's like a little bit of flapping. Uh, let's see if there's another good shot. Yep, like right here in this top corner, you can see some wrinkles there. So what I actually did is I took that skeletal mesh of the dragon and I took it into the cloth painting stuff, just like we did it with our simple plane. And I started to go through these areas in between the bones and basically cloth painted them just like we did. Um, and so as he was flapping, you could actually see that that kind of skin flap around a little bit. And of course, I added some wind to also give it some dynamics of it actually moving and so forth. Um, one thing you do have to be careful is you got to make sure the physics assets of the character is set up. Um, this one had some really big like collision physics. So it was causing some weird effects. So I had to go in and, and get rid of some of those collision asset uh, collision spheres or capsules inside of the character so that it would actually work properly. But that's a, another way that you could kind of use, you know, cloth to do some pretty cool stuff like that. Um, give me just a moment, fellas. I need to let the dog out. All right, sorry about that. Let me grab a quick drink here. I've been talking a lot. So. So real quick, let's go ahead and hop into, um, let's say we're gonna do a cape, okay? Uh, like I said, I don't know a ton about this type of stuff on characters. So I think there's a lot more involved um, and I feel like this stuff actually it needs to be a part of the same skeletal mesh and so by doing that we can't just like simply make a cape and just drop it on the character very well but I'm gonna show you real quick just an idea but there are some good tutorials out there on how to actually like weight paint uh, or like cloth paint on a character so say you brought a character in and it already had a cloth like a um a cape on it you could go into it and you need to like cloth paint on that so that it will actually simulate and so forth but let's see let's just start a new little map here okay and let's say we take our third person character here, drag and drop them in, right? Um, if you don't know, if you lift something up, um, I'm gonna delete the player start. If you lift something up and then you press end on your keyboard, it'll snap it to the floor or whatever's below it. Um, so we have our character here and if we play, um, so if you don't know this, just another quick little tip. So if you drag and drop your character in like this, um, under the details panel, if you search possess and auto possess player, if you set that to player zero, um, that's a good way to, okay, this particular character right here that I'm modifying or doing stuff with, that is the one I want to play as when I play the game. Okay. Um, so let's say we take our cloth. <clears throat> we're going to take our same mesh for now just because it's what we have and we're going to pull that in and what we're going to do is we need to hop into the actual mesh and let's activate our cloth paint again and we are going to do something super super simple this is going to look super janky okay uh, but kind of give you an idea of how you might achieve something like this okay so under my brush tools I'm gonna set that to like 10 and our paint value, we're gonna set that to zero because I'm gonna, I want an area that is not being simulated anymore, okay? Just one little dot like that. And we're gonna deactivate. 
the cloth paint mode. Hop back into our level. Let's simulate so we know where it's at. So it's this opposite side here. I'm gonna rotate that. And we are going to, let's just center everything up here. Center, oops, I don't wanna undo the rotation. Our character is centered. So um, what I'm going to do is take this cloth and I'm gonna drag and drop it on top of our uh, third person blueprint here in the thing. Basically that makes it like a child, um, attaches it to that, that other asset. And let's see, I'm gonna put this up to somewhere around here, okay? And if we simulate, we need to set up our other stuff. So we need to basically take our cloth asset. So each time you add this cloth asset into your thing, you're gonna wanna enable these same options pretty much every time. So under clothing, uh, collide with environment, collision update, and then we're gonna search max and create, uh, max out our max collision distance scale, okay? So now if we simulate, um, and so you can see what is happening is like we are no longer colliding or we're not colliding with the character itself, okay? So this is where things get a little complicated <clears throat> and I'm not entirely sure how to do all of this. So if somebody is aware of how to do this, uh, make sure you let me know, I would appreciate it. So the next thing we do, it'd be really nice if we could get it to uh, collide with at least the floor. So like I said, this floor asset is just kind of a weird floor. So I'm gonna delete that and we are going to add a shape and add a cube. Sometimes the plane does not work super, super good for collisions. So we're gonna take this cube and we're gonna scale it up like that. Let's drop it down a little bit. Actually, we'll just zero it and then we'll bring our character up, press end or drop them to the floor. So if we simulate now, you can see the cloth will hit the ground. So we're getting a lot of weird stuff happening here. Like I said, this is kind of where chaos cloth gets a little finicky. There's tons of settings in the cloth stuff that you have to kind of play with and adjust and change. There's settings with actual like um, interactions. So when you can have everything be like completely static until f there's a force, um, different stuff like that. OK, <laughs> so there's just things to keep in mind here. Um, this is not big enough, so I'm going to move it down, something like that. So just an idea, okay? We're getting a lot of weird funky jiggles and vibrations and stuff. Um, we don't necessarily want that. However, that's what we have at the moment, okay? Um, so for those of you who aren't aware, a character like this um, typically has what they call a physics asset. So if we select our character here and we press Control B, that takes us to our third person blueprint, right? But that is all part of the characters folder here under mannequins and then meshes, right? So we know that this is this is Quinn, not Manny. So if we go into Quinn, and I want to say it's the the more complex one, not the simple one. So when you open up a skeletal mesh, uh, typically there's these buttons up here to get to associated assets as part of that skeletal mesh. Okay. So this one here is where we're at, the skeletal mesh. This one that looks like a skeleton, that switches to the actual skeleton for it. So this is where all your bones and everything are, right? And then um, this is like an animation section. Uh, this one here is for the actual uh, uh, animation blueprint right here. And then this one here where it kind of looks like a bone a little bit. I'm not exactly sure, but this is the physics asset, okay? So if we select that, this is the actual physics asset that is associated with um, the skeletal mesh, okay? And so the physics asset is what is basically telling, okay, if this gets simulated and it ragdolls, what happens? This is where all your collisions are based. So if you, you see all these little blue purple capsules here, or, yeah, purple, purple pink, all these little capsules are basically the collisions. So on a skeletal mesh, the actual mesh itself is not a collision. You have to set up these little uh, 
you know, collision boxes basically everywhere inside your mesh. So this one is set up very nicely in it and it looks pretty good. And you can see if you select all of them like that, you can actually see all the different pill boxes and everything that make it up and it fits the character pretty well. Okay. So I'm not entirely sure why sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't work. Okay. So um, I just wanted to show you that because if you're going to do something with a character, like I mentioned, the actual dragon, I had to go through and make sure these pill boxes were in the right places of the bones in the wing because the bones in the wing, they were super big and they were just messing up the cloth. And so you want to be careful with that. Okay. So this isn't necessarily how you would want to do this. I'm just showing you a, a kind of an, a general overview uh, what's going on, Luke? Nice to see you too, man. Um, this is just kind of a general overview of how you would do it. Uh, an actual cape would probably be included in the same skeletal mesh, not exterior like we are doing here. Um, and you're going to see a lot of funky, weird artifacts going on. So let's just close a couple things here. We don't need all this stuff open. Um, so I think here what we need to do is if we select our blueprint, and I don't know if the actual like collision properties here make a difference or what. So the collision preset is set to a character mesh, but if I set that to block all, that does not help us at all. Okay. And this is where we're just... We're experimenting with a couple things just to see here. Okay. Just want to try something. So it's not colliding with our character, but you could see as I move around and, and you're going to get some glitchiness. Oh, wow. A lot of glitchiness. <laughs> Part of it is because of how fast the character moves. And basically it becomes like this pivot point where it's connected. And so imagine that pivot point is a solid thing, but when the character moves, it goes goes like that. It doesn't do this nice smooth transition. So you're going to get a little bit of that too. Okay. Um, so that's just something to kind of keep in mind when that uh, is happening. Um, let's just take a sphere real quick. I'm going to drag and drop this sphere in our scene just so we have something else. We can put this here. And now you can see I keep doing simulate instead of play. You can see how it does interact with stuff like that, right? So as I move over here and I walk over this, I can jump over it. You can see how stuff like that would actually interact in your scene and stuff, okay? Um, you do want to be careful with this. This is not like there's a lot of different things at play here. Um, let's see what we can do. I'm going to show you basically how I did the actual cloth on the dragon, right? Of course, the the dragon was way different. You wouldn't necessarily do it to this character because there's no cape or cloth on them. But let's say we wanted to jump into our Quinn, right? And the same process we started with earlier. So you're going to take your skeletal mesh. Let's turn off editing tools because we don't need that. We're going to right click. We're going to create clothing data here. And so this has already got a physics asset. So it shows you that we're going to create Quinn clothing data. Okay. And then we're going to right click again and apply that clothing data that we just made. That usually just takes a couple seconds here. I'm just going to do applying the skin data. Okay. So we have done that now. Now we can go into, um, we're going to select that clothing data on the side and activate our cloth paint. So the way this mesh is made up, uh, there's different sections here, right? So we're not seeing everything. We can't paint everything, but I think it has to do with the different sections that you uh, apply the, clay, the clothing data to. So um, just for silly, goofy, dumb funsies, um, this is not the way you would do this. However, if, if you had a cape here, maybe this is how you would do it. Okay. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to set the paint value to hundred and I'm going to take an 
paint her hand here. Um, and there's a enable uh, brush flow, and then you can ignore back facing stuff. So I want to make sure, I think I hit that there too. So let's undo that real quick. Yeah, and ignore back facing. So that way it doesn't try to paint stuff that you're not seeing. Um, the viewport while you're in this mode is a little buggy and weird. So just be aware of that. So at the moment, I'm just trying to see if I can actually paint these hands a little bit. I'm going to set my brush to smaller here. And it feels like it's not really getting everything. So this may not work, but this is kind of an idea of you'd have a skeletal mesh and say it would actually have the cape included in it or a piece of clothing or area because um, we're not going over full chaos cloth, the new cloth panels and stuff like that that just got introduced. That's a much more complex system. Uh, this is like just simple chaos cloth. OK, so I'm going to deactivate cloth paint mode. I'm going to see what happens here. Okay, so super, super weird. You can see kind of went all funky on us and we have this weird bulge right here, right? So this is kind of an example of what happened with the um, the uh, dragon when I did it. So what is happening is there's a collision box. So when you cloth paint something inside the same asset, it automatically det detects those uh, uh, physics assets. So if I come to that physics asset, which there should only be one physics asset for both Manny and Quinn. Yes. So I'm gonna grab these two boxes here. I'm gonna delete those. Press save. Go back to our Manny Queen. Click on save there. I don't know if it's gonna auto update on us or not. And let's just double check. I'm just going to delete a few of these just to get them out of the way. Just to make sure. And we might have to activate cloth paint and deactivate again. See if that fixes that. Yeah. <laughs> so there we go. We have our flappy arm girl uh, robot thing. So you could see how like Basically, if that was a cloth area, you could set that up as a cloth area that's going to move and, and flex and jiggle and stuff like that. Um, it'd be a, a, a nice way to do it, right? <laughs> okay, so this is all going to look a little funky. And I don't know, we're not getting it on our player character here, but maybe we need to bring her back in. And actually, it's possible that it's using the simple or complex one. So put our third person character back in and then, yeah, right now it's using the simple one and we modified using the complex one. So let's put that one in. <laughs> Anyways, I'm not too sure on that. Like I said, I just wanted to briefly cover that so you guys had any an idea of how you might be able to do that with actual like a cape on, on it or attached or so forth. So um, I'm going to take the next few minutes or so and kind of open things up for questions, comments, um, stuff like that. If you guys have ideas for some other videos, some things that are maybe some quick little things that we could jump into here real quick, you know, whether it's cloth related or not, um, we could always jump into those and check some stuff out. Um, so go ahead uh, in, in the chat, man, you guys uh, drop some comments or questions and let's go over a few things. Let's see what you guys got. And while you guys are prepping that, I'll get a new level. I'm not going to save that one. Um, and just some general info. Um, 
So uh, anybody, any of you guys that actually know me or talked to me before and stuff, um, most of what I do is just kind of hobbyist for fun. Um, I've done freelance work and things like that. But uh, about six weeks ago, I actually got picked up for like a little six week contract with Tippet Studios. So if you're not familiar with them, um, I'll pull them up real quick. I can't say exactly what I was doing um, there, but it was some Unreal Engine work for sure. So this is uh, Tippet Studios and some of the stuff they've done in the past. Worked on some pretty cool movie stuff. I think Winter Soldier was one of their more recent things that they um, worked on, which was pretty cool, a lot of fun. Um, Chaos Destruction. So uh, Sanjeev, um, yes. So I definitely am going to do some Chaos Destruction stuff. Um, we could actually do a real quick thing with that because it's super, super easy. Uh, there's definitely some other more complex stuff with uh, Chaos uh, Physics um, and Destruction. Um, if you are familiar or not, there is a place called Redefine FX. Um, and the guy is, the guy's name is Jesse and he does some incredible, uh, Niagara, um, Niagara fluid simulation, um, tutorials. He did have a free course and I know he's got a paid course. Um, I bought that. It was really, really good. And he is actually coming out with a new chaos destruction, uh, course, um, should be this month, I think maybe in a week or so. And I am super pumped. I'm probably going to buy that course also, uh, because it looks it's very exciting. There's some stuff in there. I have definitely done some chaos, uh, physics stuff and destruction. Um, it is a lot of fun. There's some pretty cool stuff that you can do. Um, so I would like to, uh, we could definitely dive into some more stuff with that. I think, in the last live stream uh, where we just played around with physics stuff, I think we briefly touched a little bit of chaos destruction. Um, Elfenstein, if you ever figure out the cloth panel system, I'd love someone to... Un yeah, um, I would love to dive into the cloth panel stuff, but there is a lot of stuff there that I'm not familiar with at all. Um, and I've seen a couple, like, not really tutorials, sort of tutorials, but it seems still very, very complex because you still got to take all that data from something else like Marvelous or something like that or where you're making the clothing. And you got to bring that over and you got to set it up and it's got to like simulate first. And there's a lot of stuff. Um, but I have hopefully as as people get to learn it and more more resources come out, I would love to dive into that because uh, there's some pretty cool um I mean, if you could start getting some clothing simulations and decent looking stuff, I would love that. Um, Chaos Cloth does an okay job for basic stuff. I have several characters that I've bought on the marketplace that uh, have, you know, capes and little cloth areas and stuff, and they simulate and move, and it's 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 decent for what it is. But if you're trying to get like a full dress or something like that, you definitely need to be more in that pipeline of like... Uh, uh, marvelous designer and stuff like that and be able to bring that over. Um, another thing, if you guys aren't familiar with, there's a really cool, uh, thing called meta Taylor. I actually going to try to get with them and do, they were looking for some people to do, uh, videos and stuff for them. Uh, I want to get with them and put together a pretty cool tutorial on taking, uh, clothes. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's called meta Taylor. And it is a pretty awesome way to be able to take basically any clothes. Uh, you'll bring in a metahuman and you can put the metahuman in there and basically kind of rig it or it's already rigged and weight painted, but you take that, you bring in clothing from just about anywhere and you can get the clothing to fit that character. So one of the things that metahumans has been struggling with is clothing. Uh, all the clothes look the same. There's hardly any options. So this would be an awesome way to be able to get uh, custom clothes on top of your metahumans. Now, it's not simulating. There's no physics, nothing like that. But it is a really, really cool way to be able to get uh, custom clothing going on. So let me show you guys real quick. I'll pull up um, a couple that I did recently. I haven't animated them or anything like that yet. 
but uh, it's definitely uh, it's all custom custom fit. So uh, this is a custom uh, metahuman face that was brought in from. It's called 3D Scan Store. They're putting out these really cool. Uh, custom meshes and textures for metahumans. So if you're looking to take your metahumans to the next level, they're not horribly expensive and you can catch them on sale. And they come with their own texture sets and a mesh that you'll do mesh to metahuman with. And then you can see the clothing here. The clothing here was actually really, really inexpensive clothing that was bought on ArtStation. And I used MetaTailor to be able to bring it in and fit it to a, a custom MetaHuman, which is pretty awesome. Um, and it's pretty detailed. And you can, you can see the face here that this almost doesn't even look MetaHuman-ish besides maybe the eyes a little bit. Um, because uh, MetaHuman's just there's only a certain amount of textures. There's only a certain amount of faces that you can kind of do without doing mesh to metahuman. So this has definitely opened up a lot of cool stuff. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Elfenstein, I don't know if they would ever get to quite the Marvelous Designer level um, inside Unreal. I mean, they're pushing for stuff. Like, I never thought they would have the panel system, but, you know, they're... Epic is always sneaking in these cool little things every update. And uh, just so you guys know, GDC is this week. And I believe uh, State of Unreal is going to be this week. Um, so expect something big. I, I would expect 5.4 probably in some pretty big updates. So be ready for that. Um, yeah, Meta Taylor and Kit Bashing Clothes from Sketchfab is so good. Like, it's surprisingly, shockingly good. Like, I never thought it could be quite that easy. Um, and like I said, I've only messed around a, a little bit. But if you go on, like, ArtStation, um, there's people that make marvelous designer clothes. And they sell them for, like, a dollar or two for, like, a pack of five. It's it's wild. I don't know how they get away so inexpensive. Some of them have no UVs and no textures and stuff. So, like, even this one here had no UVs and textures. But I basically just added materials inside of Unreal, you know. Found some leather materials, stuff like that, and just put it in there. Um, 5.4. I've seen a couple quick videos of some people who had, like, you know, they were doing the compiling themselves or whatever because you can you can get 5.4 early and you can compile it yourself or whatever and, and play with around with it but i'm not interested in really doing that but if you do um that type of stuff uh 5.4 has got some movie render queue changes i guess there's a whole like movie render queue graph instead of like uh check boxes and stuff like that you can build out like a custom graph system which i don't know if that seems all that great in my opinion um, I have heard that, uh, Niagara fluids in the water department has got some big updates coming hopefully because, uh, the Niagara fluid water is very, very, very simple. Like you can do some stuff and it looks okay, but fire and smoke, you know, is pretty good with Niagara fluids, but I think you need to... They got a lot of work to do on the water section of stuff, but if they could do some cool water stuff, I cannot wait. I would love to do some really, really good water simulations. However, um, I do know that like Liquid Gen from Jenga FX, so Ember Gen and Liquid Gen, uh, Liquid Gen should be coming out, but it would be nice to be able to do a lot of that stuff custom in Unreal would be amazing. Um, the leather textures here that you see on this particular one, those were all done. Um, in, uh, that was an art station also. It was like a pack of leathers. I think it might have even been from the same care, or, uh, same uh, person, but it was like burlap and leather and stuff like that. So a um, bunch of pretty cool, pretty cool uh, stuff there. Art station has actually got a lot of stuff. Super, super cheap for the most part. Um, uh, Niagara fluids. I've done a little bit, of, uh, a couple of videos kind of covering that. I would love to do a full live stream where we cover a little bit more of Niagara fluid stuff, just so people can kind of get an understanding, but, um, it's tough. A lot of these systems are pretty, pretty complex. There's a lot of things happening there. Um, you know, and each person's project is different. 
I don't know if Luke is still in here or not, but he's one that, you know, he went through the same course that I kind of did. And for some reason, his project just had lots of troubles with Niagara fluid and we helped him out a couple times and we just couldn't, couldn't quite get it set up. Um, for whatever reason, it was uh, pretty difficult. Um, let me open this one up too. This was another, um, uh, another, it's actually the same face, uh, but slightly different textures, uh, metahuman plus, uh, different, uh, clothing and, um, uh, meta -teller. again, another art station, like cloak set up and stuff, uh, a cloak and stuff like this is a little difficult because it kind of treats the whole cloak on the same weight painting, which isn't what you really want. So some of that like stretches and stuff, but something like this, this is where you would probably go in and you could cloth paint some of this. Uh, that would probably be one way of doing some pretty cool cloth physics like we did. Uh, you could do that on top of this actual mesh here. Pretty pretty cool way of doing that. Um, trying to think of some other stuff that we were going to cover. Um, real quick, I'll just show you how you can do something real simple with uh, chaos, chaos stuff. Um, Let's go to our modeling tools and I'm just going to make a sphere here. And let's see, let's center this puppy out and set it to like 300. Okay. And then, um, <clears throat> so if you're not familiar with chaos, uh, like fractures and stuff like that, um, I'm going to select a sphere here and we're going to come over here to fracture and under here, what we need to do is we need to generate a new geometry, geometry collection. So you click on new. Um, I'm just going to, we're just going to put it under this folder folder for now here. Um, you can always create your own custom folders, but now it's basically been, uh, you've gener generated a geometry collection and we can start fracturing. So I really like the cluster effect here, but you can do uh, brick and slices and radials and lots of different stuff. So I'm gonna choose the cluster here. You gotta be careful with some of these. If you get too high on your numbers, you'll start uh, you know, it just takes more off your system. But if you're using like it, uh, this type of stuff for cinematics, uh, really cool way. So I'm going to cluster it 30 by 30. Um, the other thing that you can do here is noise amplitude. Um, so typically a lot of times when you uh, cut something up with fracturing, it's flat on the inside. But if you use a noise and frequency, um, that's a pretty cool way of actually like um, giving it texture on the inside of the break. Uh, definitely more resource intensive and stuff like that but a uh, pretty cool way. I'm going to just type in five and five in those. I'm going to fracture that real quick. I'm going to take just a few seconds here. Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of pretty good physics stuff inside of Unreal, and there's a lot of ways that you can utilize that stuff. That's kind of why I did the last live stream of just going through a bunch of different physics stuff and how you can use it. Um, I'll probably do another stream at some point and diving into some more of that. Uh, there's like really cool Niagara particle physics stuff too. So that gets pretty wild though. Um, so we have fractured here and the best way we can tell is if we do the explode amount. So now you can see our sphere has been exploded and you can see we get a little bit of texture on the inside of these, not just like flat slices and stuff, which is pretty cool. Uh, stick our explode back down and what we're going to do is now uh, once you've fractured something out if you come over here to your details panel with it selected you search bone and you're going to uncheck show bone colors so that we don't see all of that okay and we're going to switch back over to selection mode and just kind of leave that there um next thing you need to do is you need to turn on simulation for the actual object so simulate physics is on there. So if we simulate now, we'll fall. Um, we're not getting enough breaking here. So, um, all right, guys, you know, I'm actually going to call it a wrap. I got a phone call coming in and, um, but, uh, once you, uh, break this up you just change the weight on it, your mass, uh, let's see. 
go to mass real quick. Let's take up our mass to say a hundred. Simulate. Eh, maybe a thousand. Ten thousand. Yeah, we'll have to check it out. I I forget offhand, um, but definitely some of this is included in the other physics live stream that we did. But thank you guys so much for joining. I really appreciate it. Um, make sure you check out createunreal.com. It's where I'm doing all of my stuff there, putting up tutorials and videos and um, asset stuff. I have some new assets in the, in the works, so make sure you check out um, you know my marketplace stuff. I really appreciate displacer tool, uh, gl my glass shader. I've got a bunch of photo scan stuff in there. If you're interested, also I know everybody's always asking for money, but check out my Patreon. Uh, all the links will be down below and stuff like that. I really appreciate you guys and your support um, in doing these videos. It's really been a lot of fun. Um, if you guys have any ideas of assets that you might like to see in the marketplace, let me know. I am working on something new. I started working on something yesterday that would kind of tie in with my path tracing glass shader. So um, I'm a big uh, avid person for path tracing. So I got another cool shader coming. But um, I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Uh, CreateUnreal.com. Make sure you subscribe to YouTube channel. If you're not already, hit the thumbs up, like, all that good stuff. It really does help, guys. Like, um, it does. <laughs> Generally, I know everybody says that. So um, awesome. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it.